Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Oxford University Press Pakistan, I, Seema Khalid, would like to welcome you all to the first webinar. Um, the title of today's webinar is Flipped Classrooms. Before we commence with the session, I have a few announcements to make. Um, there will be a six second delay in the transmission to all participants as we go through this live session. Um, can you please keep your devices on mute, which will help us avoid any background noise. The chat box is open for questions and comments throughout the webinar. However, the question and answers will be addressed in the last 20 minutes of the webinar. E-certificates will be provided for attendance, so please look out for the link in the chat box towards the end. Fill in your details to receive the certificate in your inbox. If you don't click on the link and if you do not fill in the details, you will not receive the e-certificate. Let us now proceed with the session. The session will be facilitated by Nida Mulji. Nida Mulji is working with OUP as Senior Manager Professional Development. Before joining OUP, Nida has taught communication skills and English courses for several years as a university lecturer in Dubai. She has an MA in post-colonial studies, literature and culture, culture from Goldsmith University of London, a Cambridge certificate from English language teaching to adults and a postgraduate certificate in higher education from Middlesex University. Nida writes regularly for Dawn on topics in education and has recently authored a book on parenting. Over to you, Nida. Thank you, Seema, for that lovely introduction and a very good afternoon to you all. And if you are watching from a different time zone, good morning or good evening. This is a webinar on flipped classrooms. So some seven years ago, there was an article in the Teachers College Journal um, in 2013, which changed the face of teaching in many classrooms around the world. This was by Alison King, who spoke about the changing role of the teacher from the sage on the stage to the guide on the sides. As our classrooms become inverted through the pandemic, we'll talk about activities of engagement and what we can do to use flip learning strategies. In fact, we can take out the word classrooms from flip learning now and talk about what, how we can best serve our students through online teaching. So I would like you to take a minute to think about your changing role as a teacher. How has your talk time changed? Did you talk a lot more before and much less as you um, teach children through online means? How has the student's behavior changed in online learning? How do you keep your students motivated throughout your classes? What activities can engage them in online learning? These are the things we'll talk about during this webinar. And if you can put your comments in the chat box, that will really help as we go along. We will have a Q&A in the end for half an hour and we will get to discuss all your comments, hopefully um, as many as we can take during half an hour at the end. So what is a flipped classroom? The idea of a flipped classroom is to preview new content at home and consolidate learning in the class. It allows for blended learning opportunities and differentiated learning. What that means is that the classroom has literally turned on its head the teacher does not necessarily have to stand at the head of the classroom and teach in a traditional way using a blackboard or even a whiteboard or a smart board. What you can do as a teacher is provide material with key information that students can review at home and then work through activities. In a traditional classroom, you have the teacher talking and children take homework at home. What happens in flipped learning is that the activities are done um, at home and then they're discussed in the classroom through various engagement uh, projects or learning tools. So the learning cycle in a flipped classroom involves setting up a task, reading or a project and the teacher would provide if there were blended learning opportunities would provide a video for students to learn uh, to see and look out for key information and then discuss them, discuss with them back in the classroom what um, they have picked up 
from their learning, students retain far more information when they can personally respond to a text. The teacher can then play online games or ask concept checking questions. Also engage students in peer learning activities where, we get, where they get to chat about what they've learned, ask each other questions or engage in self correction activities where they're given sentences to write and then review their work um, as they go along to figure out where the learning gaps are. When they're given a tutorial back in the class or through online means when the students get a chance to engage with the teacher directly one to one, the teacher can monitor students very closely for differentiated learning. So every student will not be at the same level or style of learning. And this enables the teacher to sit with each individual and take them through their learning journey according to their personal needs. Next comes reinforcement of learning outcomes that we can do through worksheets. We can do them through digital tests. We can also do them through just class discussions, a question and answer session or activities and games which are available online. The rationale behind this. So flipped learning started with a simple observation. Students need their teachers present to answer questions or to provide help if they get stuck. If students are struggling with an assignment, a task or a test, they might need guidance or mentorship. They don't necessarily need their teachers present in class, uh, talking them through a text or explaining line by line, because that would mean that they only um, can they can only absorb what the teacher knows. Sometimes students learn to want to learn to go beyond what their teacher knows. And um, students can be thought of, as Alison King said in that article stage on the stage, students can be like carpenters. So they get the tools and the key, which is in the form of key information in learning to be able to construct their own knowledge. And that can go way beyond what someone else knows in the classroom or what the teacher can teach. So the teacher doesn't necessarily need to have any talk time at all. Sometimes when teachers talk, students might want to take down notes and memorize them. And that kind of information would be superficial. It would not be deep information that they can use in their da daily experiences in life or apply when the need be. So um, Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams began the flipped classroom through this observation. They had students watch recorded lectures for homework and complete their assignments, labs and tests in class when they came back. So there was no homework really. It was more like uh, there was no written homework. It was more like classwork when they came back. And Bergman and Sams found that their students demonstrated a deeper understanding of the material than ever before. How does a flipped classroom work? So the traditional classroom has the teacher instructing, students take notes, students follow guided instruction. The teacher gives an assessment and students have homework to complete. But in flipped learning, the teacher instructs lessons at home, the students work in class and they develop a deeper understanding of concepts and they receive support from the teacher as they go along. The greatest advantage of a flipped learning classroom is that students get individual attention and they're taken through their struggle one by one. They get to work in groups and they can maximize peer learning opportunities as well. Why flip a classroom? Well, this is one way of making a class student centered. So if you don't want a teacher led classroom where the teacher does most of the talking, because in that scenario, we can never get a very good idea of how much the students have learned. We can't gauge what each child has learned until we get feedback from them, until we ask them questions and they get to share their knowledge. So to flip a classroom to make it student centered would mean giving them opportunities to share what they've learned with each other or with the teacher. They would also have to be adaptable to change. 
So when their homework changes from a particular concept to another, can they apply themselves and quickly deal with new learning um, by, by using the tools that they know to decode the information? Are they capable of collaborative learning, which means can they work in groups and teams? Can they contribute knowledge when they are put in groups in the classroom? Can they share ideas? Do they have the communicative power and the critical thinking power to come up with ideas that they can share with each other? Is there intrinsic motivation? A flipped classroom engages students in ways that develops intrinsic motivation simply by giving them the control, the reins to construct their own learning. And when that happens, students get engaged to a point where they take responsibility towards their learning. They uh, become independent and the teacher's role sort of fades away slowly as they grow up towards their college or university level. And then they're in a position to handle um, their learning and adapt to change much faster than someone who has been used to relying on the teacher telling them what to do and what to learn. Flip learning is also goal oriented. So students are given tasks and they're given SLO student learning outcomes. They know what they must learn. They are also given the tools to be able to apply the knowledge to get to those learning outcomes. And then eventually they um, make their way to it by following the tasks and um, the, the tools given to them. The advantage of flipped learning is that students can learn anywhere, anytime. Again, the reliance on the teacher is much less than it would be in a teacher-led classroom. And the reason why flipped learning has found so much success and manages to engage and motivate students is that students can learn anywhere, anytime. Students have changed. They don't want to sit um, on a bench all day listening to the teacher. So if you look at uh, the pictures on the screen, it goes from one child struggling through traditional work to children learning together, enjoying what they're doing in their own comfort zone. And you might notice as um, online learning teachers now, um, as teachers using online tools, you might actually notice that students are more engaged because they're in the comfort of their homes while they get to chat and contribute and share information with each other. Teachers have also changed. So at one point, teachers would have a lot of talk time. Um, they were the sage on the stage and students would listen to them. Gradually, they've moved to being the guide on the side because students really need guidance and mentorship. If you think about experiential learning, the example that comes to mind is uh, the example that Knowles had given of um, uh, students learning to ride, a, a, a child learning to ride a bicycle. When the child gets onto a bicycle, there is no way to teach them how to ride a bike by teaching them the names of the parts. A student cannot learn the names of the parts, learn, learn the mechanics of riding a bike and actually learn how to ride a bike. The only way they can do it is by practically experiencing it with a guide on the side, letting go when it's required. That is the journey that a student follows from reliance on the teacher to getting guidance from the teacher to gaining independence with their learning tools. So the teacher's role as the guide on the side, what exactly does the teacher in a secondary school classroom have to do? The guide on the side helps students learn at their own pace. They're not rushed. They're not cramming large amounts of text in the given time. They are not being asked to memorize anything. They're being asked to engage with the text and they're being encouraged to be motivated enough to dig deeper and ask questions about it and learn the communicative, um, to have the communicative ability to share those answers and identify the gaps in their learning. And how does that happen? That happens when the teacher can provide individual attention and engage with every child's bite-sized work 
individually and help them reflect and observe on their own learning and the tasks that they're doing to understand where they're struggling, to understand what they find hard and what they find easy. If they're struggling with something, they stop, they rewind, they go through it again and again. But everyone at the same time doesn't have to do that. If one child is struggling, they will learn at their own pace. A child who is quicker to pick up uh, learning will move on faster co to consolidating learning through perhaps more challenging tasks. So it allows for differentiated learning. It also allows for ongoing assessment because when the teacher is engaging individually with children, he or she will get a very good idea of where each child is on their learning journey. And what they can then do is start rewarding effort rather than rewarding the output in a test or um, a formal summative assessment. Teaching and learning in the new normal means being able to respond to transformation. What kind of transformation are we talking about in the pandemic times? We're talking about a situation where we have to start using student-led approaches. They can't be teacher-led approaches anymore because we can't have students sitting in front of us in the classroom and talk to them and then give them tests and assessments. So we've got to give them the reins to learn and give them the control. How do we start giving children that control? Well, we can show them videos. We can bring in blended learning activities um, from the internet, use tasks, games, and projects for them to experiment with, observe, and come back with their findings. What we then do is we reward the engagement and the effort rather than the, what they actually produce. What they can tell you about their journey of researching and finding information is more important than the information that they provide you. So there will be no right or wrong answers. It will be about teaching them to take control of their own learning. They are also learning to navigate technology. There are many students who haven't been able to crack the, the online tools required for blended learning up until now when they're being thrown into the deep end and they have had to learn to use a laptop. They've had to learn to use a smartphone. They've had to learn to download information that is sent to them by the teachers. They've had to learn to mute, unmute themselves in online classes. They've had to learn online behavior where they have to give each other turns to talk or answer questions in the chat box. So they've learned to operate the chat box. That kind of transformation is huge for many students who haven't been exposed to it before. And then they have flexible assessments, which obviously means that the teachers do not get a chance to give a full worksheet with questions on it, like in traditional times, but they can flash um, questions on the screen one at a time and have the students answer them at their own pace and in shorter bite-sized um, tasks rather than a three-hour exam, which is also possible, but it's only possible um, when they've gone through the entire year of online work like that. Our Oxford English and International Approach is a series that supports flipped learning. So this is uh, the tasks in our book are student-centric. Um, they help the students take responsibility and control of learning. There's creativity, collaboration, communication, and um, there's engagement, there's motivation in the tasks because they can either do it individually or they can do it um, amongst their peers. And there are ways of assessing learning which are detailed in the book. So if we go on to looking at the series, we've got books one to four, which are for pupils aged between 11 and 16. This is for secondary school. It aligns with the IGCSE curriculum and it is for users of English as a strong language or those that want to achieve near native fluency in English. It comes with a student book, a teacher's guide, and a workbook. And these books are um, student-centric in the sense that they will cram a lot of learning 21st century skills in one unit. So here is a page, for example, why is friendship important? 
this is page 154 and we've got annotation right in the beginning sometimes finding a friend can make all the difference in an individual person now there's a little note here to introduce this topic to the students and let them know what the entire text is going to be all about what that annotation does is it introduces the idea that a child can think whichever way they like to about the topic and then before they actually read the poem in front of them they can look at the guiding questions so they know what key information to look for the teacher could also introduce them to the vocabulary in context by eliciting um, vocabulary from them so something that is not local is and they would hopefully come up with the word foreign you can use the idea of antonyms to elicit vocabulary or you can talk about someone who lives in your own land is um, local someone who does not live in your land is and then um, have the students answer those questions so we can take them through the word pool after they've read the poem after they've thought about what friendship means to them you could give them guiding questions or experiential learning questions where they link the learning to their own experience and they talk about uh, their own friends and why they're important to them uh, what can a friend do for you what can you do for your friend what would the world be like without friends why are friends important in a community how does it improve or help our community life through all these guiding questions that start with either why, when, how, what, or yeah. So these are questions that are open-ended, no right or wrong answers. They will help reflection. And um, after giving them a bit of um, questions, uh, prompts as questions, questions as prompts rather, they can start thinking about what this poem would mean or what this poem would say they can also watch a video about friendship and write about what friendship means to them when all of that groundwork is done then they look closely at the questions given at the bottom right of the page how do you think the child feels not being able to speak the language or understand the rules of the new country so when you move somewhere else and you haven't been able to find a friend what would you do give them a scenario or a situation where they can conceptualize different outcomes that would help with critical thinking skills there are also projects in this book so project based learning is a very important aspect of flipped learning simply because when you have when you give the child a project that truly engages them they get to understand the learning outcomes as they go along they obviously know that they are being asked to create something or they're being asked to think deeply about something or they're being asked to discuss something, give their own opinion. And all of that comes together after they've engaged themselves in this project and then they come back and they talk about their findings. You've got an example of another topic here on the screen. How powerful is money? You could make a video a home video for students to see and then tell them what key information to look for so you're going to show them a video you're going to ask them a few questions about um, money and its role in society why do we need money can you visualize a society without money can you think about um, other things that can be used in place of money if we didn't have money is there something else we can use is money an important part of society or is money a destructive thing in society what do you think about money what's the difference between money and currency what is bullion what does it mean and then you could read this and then the students can read this little text after uh, the key uh, information prompts have been given to them when they read the text they will read it with that perspective of answering the questions that you've already asked about money when they come back to you in online classrooms or in a physical classroom they get to discuss this in greater detail and hopefully they will be in a position to share their information more openly because they've done the groundwork at home so that really is the bottom line in flipped learning 
all that groundwork that has already been done individually and independently by the student really helps them out in the classroom when they share their um, analysis or their findings together. Pre-recorded videos are a very important part, a significant part of course materials for inverting a classroom for flipped learning because it gives us um, uh, critical uh, thinking skills. If you give students questions to think about while they watch the videos, they will be in a position to um, you, you'll send the mind reeling, really. They'll be in a position to analyze <clears throat> and develop their own personal point of view. Then there are tons of online resources. We also, uh, as teachers, as guides on the side, have to teach students, especially as secondary school students who are heading into college uh, soon, uh, would need to learn how to run a search engine to do their own research. So if there's something they need to find, how do they narrow down their research? There is tons of material on the internet. How do we differentiate between authentic material and material that is not authentic? Or, um, and, and that's a bit tricky for students because they don't always know how to search through search engines. So what are the reliable sources of information that we can look into for our research? And those skills are life skills for students. Um, and then we give them reading to do for a personal response. So this is not reading that they will cram or memorize. This is reading that they will um, do for a personal response. What do you think about the situation? Or if you were to change a character's behavior, how would the outcome of the story change? Or if you give them a text which is in the form of a story, they could be asked to change the outcome, change the ending of the story. So anything that requires a personal response is something students engage with very deeply and instantly. We can also bring in experiential learning activities where students are encouraged to link learning to real life, which means that if you're talking about um, friendship, what does friendship mean to you as an individual? Give me an example from your life where you've uh, experienced a very valuable friendship and talk about that, share um, the significant aspects of that friendship with, with uh, your peers. So linking learning to ex a students' daily life experiences engages them deeply and they retain far more information. There's also gamification that research shows has worked wonderfully with secondary school students. And the reason for that is that students find motivation in being able to make decisions. There, there, there's tons of opportunity in gamification for students to make quick decisions as they're playing games online. The momentum is really fast as well. So, and, and students enjoy that. Uh, they don't have the patience anymore for because students have really changed. They don't really have the patience to go through slow um, and steady learning anymore. So because the momentum is fast, because it's challenging and because when they lose, they can always start. So if they fall down a level, if they can't go up one level, they can always restart um, and the stakes for failure are very low. That's what gamification does for students. It's only scores and they can try as many times as they like. So for them, learning is not divided between success and failure. And that really is what flipped learning does. It traces the learning journey and the progress, however slow, rather than judging the output produced. Some activities for secondary learning. Um, in flipped learning, the next step is to enable students to share their findings, to talk about it. Once they've learned, once they've engaged with the material, how are they linking it to the student outcomes that you as a teacher are responsible for? So how has the pandemic changed learning for you as a teacher? You obviously have had to dig deep into how to use online teaching to be able to encourage your children to keep their learning going. What new activities have you tried through online teaching or if you are not um, conducting any online teaching, if you would like to talk about 
um, how you keep in touch with your students and how you're keeping your own learning going or helping them learn through the pandemic in different ways. If you'd like to share that, please write in the chat box so we can discuss that during our Q&A as well. I would love to hear um, your ideas about various activities that you might have tried that we haven't discussed in this webinar at all. I'd like to share with you some examples of flipped classroom activities. So we've got um, Jeopardy here, which is like the television counterpart. If you're familiar with the, um, the show Jeopardy, the way this works is instead of giving students answers, teachers give them um, instead of the students giving us answers, they give us the questions. So for example, if I were to um, put on my screen, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, what question could you formulate from that? What question am I trying to ask? Maybe I'm trying to ask, name th can you name three countries in South Asia? Maybe that is my question. Um, my question could also be, can you name three neighboring countries? And the names of those three countries could be answering that question as well. The person who wins the point is the one who's answered with the correct question. So students are answering with questions rather than giving answers to questions. In bingo, it kind of works in reverse. So teachers could, in an English language classroom, teachers could give out definitions to different students and each one of them would hold the definitions in their hand. When the teacher asks a question, the student holding the answer in his or her hand will say bingo. And the quicker you get rid of all the answers that you have with you, the um, faster you can win the game. So the winner is the person who has said bingo and got rid of all the answers in their hand. So the teacher is asking the questions and you're matching the words or you're matching the concept against the definition that you have on strips of paper in your hand. And in online learning, this can be um, a very interesting game to play because students can be given different definitions on the side, in the chat box, this is yours. So these are your five, these are your five, and you could divide them into groups as well to do this. And then you can play bingo online without actually needing any other tools, without actually needing an online game. You can also have Oxford style debates where you have uh, one team, which is the proposition, which is for a particular topic and another team that is against. Now, going back to the topic of money in our Oxford English International Approach book, we could um, talk about, we could talk to the students when we're doing pre-work before we actually introduce the topic. We can talk about um, whether money is important in society or not. Are you for the topic? Are you against the topic? And then divide the students into two teams. Each team has a go at the other sharing their ideas and presenting their arguments. The audience get to vote at the start of the debate uh, for which side they're on. And then at the end of uh, the debate, when they have heard out all the arguments, they've got to decide if they've changed their view in any way. And the team which has been the stronger one is the one that manages to change the audience's views. Here are some other examples. The exit slip works beautifully with um, students in secondary classrooms where they're asked what they've learned during the class. And you can try this during your online classroom as well. This is a way that teachers can assess themselves. So um, students are asked to write three things that they've learned um, in that particular lesson, three things that they find hard and they would like to revisit or revise and three things that they would like to learn that they haven't had a chance to. This could also be called a reflection slip where they think about what they've learned and how they can 
change the course of their learning. And the reason why exit slips work so well is because they help students reflect on their own learning and internalize um, how they could do things differently. Then the jigsaw is a very interesting um, activity because in the jigsaw, you don't have to take the entire group of students through one text together. You can divide them up into groups or even give them different parts of the text individually to work on and answer questions or explain to the rest of the class. So they kind of become experts in that one little portion that is given to them and they dig deep into it. They, under, they, they try and understand and produce a personal response to that text and then they share it with the rest of the class. So everyone's working on a different portion of the text and then it comes together like pieces of a puzzle. Then you have the question formulation technique, which is quite similar to Jeopardy, except that this is not done in the form of a game. But when you uh, present the students with a text, all they need to do is formulate questions. So can you so give them a uh, one paragraph and ask them to make make up five questions that can be answered through the paragraph. And of course, you would have to teach them how to uh, formulate questions. It could be in the form of the four W's and the H, the what, when, where, um, how, and why. And when students learn to ask questions, they learn to dig deep for answers as well. And that's when they get the responsibility and the independence to be able to do research on their own. Um, I hope that was helpful. Thank you all very much for being here. And if you have questions and comments, please put them in the chat box so we can address them in the time that we have left. If there are any slides you would like me to revisit, please um, put that in the chat box as well. And, I, and I'll uh, flip to the si uh, slides again. Thank you, Nida, very much. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement that the link to mark your attendance in order to get the certificate has been placed in the Q&A um, bar. You can just click on that link to add in all your details to receive the e-certificate, which will be emailed to your email IDs in a few days. Um, Nida, we have lots and lots of questions for you. And the first question, which is very popular, is why is it called flipped? OK, so we began with that. Why is it called flipped is because it um, instead of the teacher talking and the students doing homework, it is flipped. It's ulta. It's inverted. So it's kind of upside down. It's turned on its head, which means that the students do the work first and uh, sorry students don't do the work at all uh, they don't do homework they um, come back to class and they do the activities in the class so they don't listen to the lecture in the class they read the material or they watch a video at home and then instead of doing homework at home they come back and they sort of do their homework in the class so the lecture is not in the class the lecture is at home in the form of a video or a text. They come back to the class to do the written activities, tasks, projects, etc. Thank you, Nida. The next question is, is there a requirement of age? Is it suitable to a particular age group? What do you have to say on that? Yes, it is actually suitable to a particular age group. It can be used um, it can be used in any age group, but um, it works really well for secondary school students and the initial research was um, on college students and it showed that they particularly enjoy the independence of researching and learning on their own. So um, it works very well for um, college students, university students, but yes, it can be used at any level. And in fact, if it's used with younger children, it gives them the tools to become independent with their learning very quickly. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is how can flipped classroom be used and how can we uh, actually how to motivate kids during the online part of the class? 
Well, um, interaction is key. So the more interactive the class, the more um, discussion based the lesson, the more engaged the students will be. So either there's got to be an activity on the screen that engages the students or there's got to be a chance for them to talk. But if the teacher is spending a lot of time talking, you will find that the students will just leave because this is not a classroom where they can sit and listen to you and you can monitor them that way. They can just very easily shut off their video and leave you. So to to capture their attention, the one of the ways that you can do that is by giving them a lot of opportunity to speak during the lesson. All right, thank you. Um, Nida, next question is, is this suitable for differently abled students? It is specially meant for differently abled students because it uh, gives the teacher, because the talk time is reduced, the teacher has a lot of time to work individually with students and to understand their uh, struggles and their problems and to be able to match the learning style and pace of each student differently. So yes, it's particularly for that. This is not a one size fits all. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone's learning the same way. It is not that traditional model. This model requires the teacher to give individual tutorials to the students and very quickly the problems that they're facing come to the forefront. All right, before I um, actually um, share the next question, I just want to tell all the participants that please click on the link mentioned in the chat box and mark your attendance. Otherwise, you won't be able to get the certificate. Nida, the next question is, would this session be available for us for future reference? Uh, this session is being recorded and if uh, you would please email um, us at um, OUP, we can arrange that for you. In fact, we can arrange for customized online training for your teachers. So if they want to learn um, the flip model uh, more in a, in, a, in a deeper way and if they want to learn how to apply it in their classrooms or through online teaching rather, um, please get in touch with us and we can arrange for online training exactly like this for your school. All right, next question. Please suggest a few incentives which will help motivate students to regularly attend these online sessions. You know, these online uh, sessions require games. So there are many, many sites that give you age appropriate games and if you Google them, you will find tons of them. Uh, in fact, there's such a huge demand now that um, these games are being developed specially for online teaching um, classes. So what I would suggest is that you start with a game and keep a scoreboard. If you are teaching younger children, you keep a scoreboard and they can add to their scores every day. Um, by playing that game in the first five minutes of your class and they maintain a scoreboard and then when they get to 100 points or 50 points or whatever you want to put down for them, they get a golden certificate or a bronze or a silver certificate. If you devise a reward system like that, they will come to your class and they'll stick there for that and then gradually start with the game and then gradually take them through the lesson. Um, that is one way of making sure that you have attendance. And then the way you engage the students through activities is up to you for the rest of the lesson. All right, Nida, we a lot of people want to ask about how to discipline during the time that the students are online. And what could be a criteria? Yeah, so um, that's a very interesting question because that is a problem that many teachers are facing. It's um, online classes are new to the students and they're new to the teachers as well. And before we reach that happy ground where everyone learns to behave online, it will be a bit of a challenge for teachers. 
and the reason why i'm saying this is because we don't have a um we don't have um a manual telling us how to you know what what kind of etiquette to follow during online lessons it's called formally it's called netiquette and that's behavior on the internet it's quite like table manners while you're eating now we grow up with table manners we grow up learning that etiquette we also grow up learning classroom etiquette because you know we start going um all the way through kindergarten when we start going to class uh, to, to to the classroom we learn how to behave in a classroom but students know, don't really know how to behave online because they have they, they don't have any prior experience of this this is all too new to them and change is um, it's it's all too new for them and change is not easy um, so this this change is going to be hard as well for teachers and for students themselves because they don't know they need to learn how to behave so one um, suggestion that i would have is for teachers to produce a manual um send a letter to the parents and ask and and read that letter out loud to your students while you're teaching them online so they know what you expect of them and there could be points such as no spamming the chat box because i know many students have been spamming the chat box they start talking to each other in the middle of the lesson and instead of putting questions or their answers in the chat box they're busy um they're talking about video games like Fortnite and Minecraft and all of that and that becomes very very difficult to teach it, for teachers to handle also there's a lot of background noise where parents are talking and that's very distracting for children so parents also have to be instructed to keep the environment a little quiet while students are online students also need to know when to mute themselves when to unmute themselves if they need to talk obviously they will unmute if they don't need to talk they can keep themselves on mute so these are things that they have to learn these need to be taught and perhaps you can put them down in bullet points perhaps you can start with housekeeping rules the rules for this lesson um in the first three minutes of the class all right now the next question is can we call flipped learning a form of collaborative learning collaborative yes absolutely collaborative learning is part of flipped learning um as is experiential learning as is um you know you call it peer learning where you can do a think pair share attitude um think pair share activity for example blended learning is also part of the flipped learning model so yes absolutely collaborative learning is uh, it, it's a significant part of flipped learning all right um the next question is how do we evaluate in our flipped classroom okay that's very interesting it's a very interesting question because um evaluation really is of two kinds are you judging output do you want to assess uh, the traditional way in uh, by giving worksheets or you know an hour long exam or 3 hour long exams or do you want to monitor the learning journey and assess and reward effort and engagement rather than output now that's a decision that schools and teachers would make individually and it's different for every school so there are schools that um, encourage project based learning and then they reward the number of hours that have been spent on the project so i know of schools that will ask students to write down how much time they've spent on this particular project 1 hour 2 hours perhaps this they've spent half an hour every day for 4 days and that adds up to 2 hours they've got to write down what difficulties they faced while doing the project who helped them out how much of the work was done by the person who helped them out they could also be asked what they learned from the project they could also be asked um what aspects of the project they didn't like they didn't want to do it what would they change next time so there's a series of questions you can ask and then you can gauge the effort that the student has put into the project from how they answer those questions and base the marks on that now the thing is it's very it's very interesting because through online teaching you can experiment in different experiment with different ways of assessing children it doesn't always have to be a flat mark of 48 out of 50 or um of 50 out of 100 it doesn't have to be that you can break it up into 
um, these points and reward effort, which is what flipped learning does. And there is a way now that parents are in lockdown, mostly with uh, their children. There is a way of uh, taking their opinion on this as well and asking them and working more closely with them because we see them on through our online classes, don't we? We could ask them how much time the child has been spending on the project. So parental support in teaching is also important and that's something uh, we have an opportunity for now through online teaching. The next question is, um, is flipped learning different from blended learning or is it the same thing? Uh, blended learning is part of flipped learning. So uh, flipped learning simply means that you've inverted the classroom and you don't have to uh, include blended learning in it or any blended component. But yes, in uh, by and large, in most cases, there would be blended learning. Learning, but to you next question. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. My connection got it, lost. <laughs> mine too. I think it was both of us at the same time. Okay, I, I can hear you now. Can All we right. have the next uh, question, please? Nita, the next question is, how can we ensure that the children are doing the work and not the parents during a flipped classroom? That's a very uh, interesting question because there's no way to ensure that. Unfortunately, uh, we have to leave some things to ethics and uh, it's an honor code. You know, just trust the children to do the work themselves, we can send out a letter to the parents and ask them to uh, leave the children to their own devices to do their own work. But that is that does not that's not a problem necessarily with online teaching or the flipped learning model. That happens anywhere, anytime, even in the traditional classroom where you send homework home to children. Sometimes it's the parents who end up doing their homework. So there's really no way of monitoring that other than discouraging parents from being um, involved in the student's learning process. I mean, involved as in they can play a supportive role, but to do homework um, for them would be quite different. All right, next question is, do we have any set criteria to um, assess the students? Can we find some criteria online? Is there a framework available? There is a framework available. There are internet sites. I will just give you one example because offhand I don't have, um, you know, I don't have a list of internet sites, but you would have to Google the flip learning model internet sites and there are plenty of them. Edpuzzle is one of them. So Edpuzzle has games, it has activities, it's got assessment sheets for a flip learning model as well. So there are plenty of resources on the internet to, that can help you. All right. Um, The next question is um, that actually a lot of participants want the content of this webinar for future reference. So you need to um, let the participants know how would that be available. Okay, if they can reach out to us on our um, email address and if, if Seema, if I could request you to put that in the chat box for them. Um, we would be happy to help them out with the information, perhaps send out a handout if that's okay with the contents of this uh, webinar. We would, we also have a um, digital platform now and this webinar will appear on that once the editing on it is done. This is being recorded today and we will make this available to you on our uh, professional development virtual platform. Seema can put, if Seema, if you could help me with putting the link for that in the chat box um, and if the participants could please check that digital platform out it's got plenty of information and lots of teaching concepts that you can learn from effective teaching strategies that you can um, implement in your classroom teaching um, Nidab, the links are already there 
Okay, um, thank you, Seema. I think this is now time for the last question. And right. the last question is that how do we ensure that we give time to every student in an online classroom? Okay, so what we can do is, um, that's also, um, th that's a great question because it's very tricky for one teacher who is handling, you know, more than 20 students at one time. Well, we, what we can do is divide the students into groups, give each group a different name, Depending on their age, you can make it fun like an octopus group, a frog group, a lizard group, an elephant group, or you can just give them letters or numbers, group one, group two, group three, and then you can give them different time slots. So one group sits with you for a particular time slot. Let's just say your class is starting at 10.45. You are giving 10.45 to 11.05 11 to group one and group and the other groups are asked not to join the online class until you're done with that one group. And then you deal with the second group and then the third group. So you can divide your online um, lessons into time slots and handle one group at a time. Individually, what you could do is leave the last three minutes um, of your online class for students to come back with their um, challenges, with their problems that they want to discuss, something that they want to go over, and while the others leave, if you have gaps between your subjects and your, your lessons, when, once the students leave, the ones who need extra help can stay behind and then you cater to them individually. So that's another way of doing it. The way this works is because students need to learn from each other in a flipped learning model. Um, sometimes teachers just need, sometimes the others need to just wait while the teacher answers questions one by one or asks them questions and then has you know the students sharing information turn by turn just like it works in a, in a normal classroom in a regular traditional classroom except that there is more individual attention being given in a flipped learning model all right thank you nida thanks a lot um, uh, we, we do have time for one more question though one more question yeah we have a couple of minutes all right um just give me a minute. Can and you elaborate on the role of the teacher in a flipped classroom? Yeah, well, the role of the teacher is that of a guide and a mentor. So you would be doing uh, much less talking than you would in a traditional classroom. And you would uh, give them more activities or give them opportunities to ask questions, to ask each other questions as well, and to engage with the text themselves and in groups or with their peers and partners, rather than with the teacher doing the talking and explaining. So let's just say explaining is just not important. It's redundant in a flipped model. Over to you, Seema. All Thank right. you very Ms. much. Thank Leda. you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I just want to make a few announcements that if you see your question and answer panel, you will find some links. The first link, which has 376 hits, is the link to register yourself for the certificate. If you do not register, you will not receive the certificate. So make sure that you have clicked on the link and entered all your details. The second link is for our webinar registration. We are doing a webinar week. So today was the first day and today was the first webinar. We will be con we will continue we will continue doing these webinars till Monday the 29th of June 2020. So if you wish to participate in our other webinars, you can do so by clicking on that link. If you want to have a look at our recorded webinars, there is Another link which will lead you to our bite-sized learning and our recorded webinars. If your question was not answered or if you have any other question for us or if you want to reach out to us to do a workshop in your school, you can always send us an email on pv.pk at oup.com. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.